Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, UW Reality Lab Distinguished Ser Lecture Series combined with the capstone that is running right now. Uh, students are developing um, exciting projects in AR and VR. Happy to welcome Andy Wilson today. Hello, Andy. Andy is a uh, partner, uh, a researcher at Microsoft Research for uh, sounds like the last 20 years, which is very uh, pretty amazing. Uh, he is a uh, very known researcher in HCI, working these days on AR and VR and real-time interactive computer vision. Um, yeah, and before joining Microsoft, uh, obtained uh, his um, you know bachelor from Cornell University and PhD and um, master from MIT. Super excited to hear what um, Andy is gonna talk about today. And sounds like it's gonna be related to holograms um, without headsets. The students that are participating in the capstone, Andy, are using these days uh, the Quest 2 or the Magic Leap, depends on what they have cho chosen to work with. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting to hear what you have to say. How, how do we do it without headsets? So yeah, welcome and um, take it away. Thank you, Yura, for the for the introduction. Uh, so, so yeah, I've been at uh, Microsoft Research for for some time, and um, anyway, I'm very happy to give you a kind of informal presentation. I'm not going to read uh, my my notes. I'm just going to walk you through uh, some projects that I've been working on, and um, and try to weave weave them together in a way that that makes sense. Um, and so. Uh, the first thing I should I should mention is that you know my video is a little bit a little strange, a little bit unusual looking. Um, so um, as Ira deduced, right, this is um, we're doing something with touch cameras. Um, so I have the ability to basically render into uh, the video. Um, so um, right, so I, I understand that Sharam Azadi gave a, um, a presentation at the UW Reality Lab at some point. Um, and so this is, you know, is kind of related to the holoportation efforts uh, that have been um, going on. So I, just to kick things off in the presentation, what I'd like to do is to um, want to call to mind uh, this movie that was uh, that came out in, in 2002, which I think is a, you know, an interesting, um, interesting vision in, uh, you know, of science from science fiction of what holoportation. You know, could be, and you'll notice that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moving the the viewport around for myself manually, and I'm doing that with a mouse and keyboard. Um, so in the movie, th so this actually came out in 2002, and this was um, came out of uh, some brainstorming with a number of technologists in academia, uh, including um, Jaron Lanier and, and a number of other folks. Steven Spielberg, Steven Spielberg was very. Um, you know, uh, was very good at sort of bringing in things that were um, plausible technically. Um, a lot of people remember the, you know, the scene with the, the screen where you gesture and do things, right? The scene that I'm showing you here, showing here is this um, more of a holoportation or, or, or free space holographic presentation. And I think the, the point I wanted to make, well, first of all, it's it's remarkable to me that in, in this, um, in this vision of the future, you know, they got a lot of the a lot of things right, where they they have the you know there's a lot of artifacts and weirdness that's very similar to what you know what I'm showing you here, right? The connect it was was several years in the future at this point, and yet they they rightly predicted kind of the you know some of the artifacts that you would see in these kinds of sensors, these two and a half D sensors, and the thing the point I wanted to make that I that that even with these artifacts, it, this memory for this character is precious, right? This is all he has of his son, right? This is Tom Cruise's character. And he is, he's watching these videos, these holograms of his, of his lost son. And then, you know, a little bit later, he actually, um, he'll watch um, an, a video of his, um, of his wife uh, who, is, who has left him, I believe, John. at this point. And so, um, so I think that these, this is kind of an interesting uh, comment, I think, on the sort of tendency to really focus on image quality. Uh, but, you know, when it's, when it's an important piece of, um, of, you know, an important memory, I'm not sure that image quality is the first and foremost consideration. Note, note the, the smoothing over her, her face, right? 
And you can you can see if you look carefully, you can see a lot of the same very same kinds of artifacts, um, you know, on me. Um, and so that's um, you know, it's a very interesting you know note note what it's doing to my glasses and this kind of stuff. It's all the same. So they, they got that all, all of this stuff completely right, and it's it's quite remarkable. So um, what I'd like to talk about really is um, what I call reality shader. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that and, and this moniker holograms without headsets. So my history at, at Microsoft is really one of, uh, you know, I, when I got started at Microsoft, I plugged myself um, into uh, this uh, kind of nebulous effort to, to do something new in the consumer space. And we produced um, this, the, the very first um, Surface device, and which was this uh, coffee table, 30 inch device. And um, it was a, a lot of fun. So this had a projector and uh, I believe five cameras underneath. And I built the first, uh, the first prototype and a lot of the very first um, interactive prototypes and sensing. And um, what I'd like to do is just show you a couple of the, a couple of the interactions Imagine that we were being doing able to paint on the surface um, back of the table, in the day. I'm gonna light instead of paint using turn this down a bit. Even your fingers. You'll note that um, this sort of, you know, it had a lot of interesting, very analog type interactions, right? This finger painting in the beginning, you know, that wasn't like rendering a point on the screen like you like you sometimes have with um, with a touch screen. We're actually taking the shape of of the uh, of the hand in, into consideration and then drawing directly on you know onto the screen. That's me um, several years ago, <laughs> twenty years ago or something. Um, so I'm going to fast forward to this. This is just a, um, you know, a, a little bit of a detail on the finger painting um, application. And, you know, this was, this was years before the iPad, um, before the iPhone. Uh, and uh, so all of this was really being done with cameras and pattern recognition and, and so forth. So you, and I always thought of this, honestly, as a, um, as an augmented reality device, uh, not necessarily as a touchpad. And I'll explain to you what I mean, but but uh, the gist of it is that this is a um, this is a table, and so you put things on a table, and so when you put things on a table, the reason that you put things on a table is so that they don't like fall away or they they don't run away from you, right? And so here's a, a full we did a full port of Trivial Pursuit where we actually use real a real die and uh, real um, player pieces as you move them around the board. And we had various kinds of interactions where you can you can hide parts of it, um, uh, parts of the information in a private way, and, and so there were all these kinds of considerations, uh, you know, for like what we could sense and what we couldn't sense. And but it but but in my um, in my work with the system, I was always very interested in what can we do that interacts with real objects. And so, so it was a little bit more like uh, AR in that sense. Here's a very early kind of photo sorting application. And the, the reason I just wanted to show this is very kind of interesting. Like this is like well before the multi-touch um, uh, craze, you know, here we're actually um, uh, moving and uh, resizing photos with uh, multi-touch. It's not quite the same as what we have today, uh, but it's pretty close. I mean, you get that kind of analog feel and you're cropping with multiple, um, that looks multiple uh, input points and that, that sort of thing. And then, you know, here's a, a really, um, here's a really interesting uh, illustration of what I mean by the AR. So these are little, um, little player um, tanks and you can set um, uh, little pieces on the, on the table, real pieces. You can control the tank with a, with a game pad and then um, drive that forward. And then no, notice that the rendering ad, you know, adds uh, tank, tracks into the scene um, and then you can uh, you know blow up trees or whatever those aren't you know th those are so there's an interesting mix between the graphics and the real objects um, which I think you know to me is very much like a, this is an AR um, kind of thing it's human against so this is a lot of fun so the, in, in this particular moment one of the tanks is actually being controlled by the computer right so we wrote a little bit of software that and the of course the that tank was pretty relentless. We had to actually like make it a little easier to play. But. So that was, um, you know, back then we called that the play table rather than surface. And then we, and when we launched it as a, as a product, we called it surface. And then, um, yeah, so then, you know, after that, I got involved uh, with some of the very earliest efforts of the company um, looking at depth cameras. 
and of course you guys know this as the as the connect and the uh, and um, this was you know this is an image of the very first connect. Um, this was uh, some work that I did even before that uh, the connect was really even you know kind of a thing at the company. This is a 3DB um, uh, device. We actually uh, Microsoft actually acquired 3DB. This is so th so this is me basically having worked on the table play table and then playing around with depth cameras, starting to think about the, the idea that you can know more about what's going on on the surface of the table, have more knowledge of you know, the 3D structure of the thing. And then you know, taking the projector from beneath the device and actually rotating, you know, putting it above the tabletop so that we can project onto the table. And so you have this uh, physics engine and uh, that's, that's doing the right thing, uh, given the, the, the depth image. And so creating a mesh from the depth image and then uh, creating this kind of you know, interesting augmented reality experience uh, driving these little cars around and seeing them uh, behave you know, slowly, <laughs> um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, kind of in a physically um, plausible fashion, right? So here in this video, I'm switching between the virtual view of the scene here and then uh, the real view. I think the real view is honestly more compelling. And then we can do these various kinds of interactions. We're we doing this sort of pinching gesture to drop things. There's an image of what the depth, those depth cameras looked like back then. And then, um, you know, because it's a depth camera, right? You, you know, you're getting this kind of funky, uh, these little interactions where you can pick up um, the object. If you're, if you're careful, the physics engine will even cooperate with you. And of course, you know, in the virtual view, you get this kind of like, you know, it's really quite clearly a two and a half D view, right? There's no sort of attempt at that point to do much of anything um, here, uh, clever. So this was well before Connect sort of, we're still playing around with it. And, and I'm thinking about, you know, different ways to, to use it in the setting of uh, tabletop interaction. Here's another early work. This was done in, uh, in uh, 2009 where we, first started networking multiple cameras together and multiple projectors and stitching them, but then also like turning this into an interactive surface. Um, the details of how we, we do intersection and touch detection, you know, they're pretty simple actually. What you do is you render the, 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 the depth camera uh, data into the scene and then you create um, a, uh, a, a, cam a graphics camera that uh, is an orthographic projection just above the table itself. And so what we're doing is we're actually creating the very same view that you get from uh, the play table. Here's another thing though, above the surface, there are all kinds of interactions. So we have a very kind of physics based, you know, very loosely um, physics based kinds of interaction. The system knows nothing about hands. It knows nothing about pieces of paper. It only knows that there's a surface in the world, and then we're uh, doing kind of a simulation against against that. So that's um, we called that light space at the time. That was the name of the system. And then, you know, uh, fast forwarding a few years, and I think what I'm going to do here is just for the heck of it, I'm just going to. There's also there's also a question. Uh, sorry, this is from a while ago, but I was curious to know if the objects that were interacting with the surface were made specifically for the surface or did the surface have sensors to detect the shape of the objects? So those were, those were cameras underneath, uh, underneath the table. And so, well, both really, uh, the answer is both. We had tagged objects where we, we printed uh, small barcodes on the object. Um, and there the advantage there, you know, you, is that you could have many pieces in a game, for example, and you knew exactly what they were without having to do you know, some kinds of pattern recognition. We also use some very primitive kinds of um, template matching uh, so that we could you know, recognize shapes um, and, uh, and do, you know, do certain things like that. In the case of the finger painting example, well, we didn't need to recognize anything. We just knew it as, a, as an object on the surface. And so if you took a, like say a paintbrush, you know, as long as that paintbrush reflected infrared light, um, it, you could use that as, you know, a paintbrush in the, in the application. It was no different than the finger, really. And um, yeah, so, so we, we, we experimented quite a bit. Now, in the case of the, the die in Trivial Pursuit, you know, like I wrote code that, that counted the number of dots on the die. Um, it turns out that 
you know, if you if you're reading a, a one on the bottom of a die, you know, that's going to be you just roll a five, right? So it's you know, you you have to write code that says you know it's it's you know the number I want is you know the number I read minus six, or you know, um, and and so you know this kind of thing, and so. So it was just a lot of fun to sort of, of trying different things. It was one of those, um, you know, really kind of interesting moments where we had just a lot of experimental stuff going on. Thank you. Okay. So I'll, I'll mush on. Um, so uh, so uh, fast forwarding a little bit, um, we, we were, you know, con uh, continuing to think about different ways that we can merge uh, the physical and the real. You know, again, with, with projection uh, technology and uh, depth images, this is a system we called um, a Luma room. And so what we have here is um, we're projecting around um, the TV. And so the, this, this projection is actually aware of where the TV is and also the where the shape of uh, the objects in, in the scene, like in your living room. And so this particular moment here, where everything is kind of distorted is when he's um, firing the gun in the game. And then you kind of see this interesting effect um, around the, um, you know, around your furniture. And so this was, you know, kind of an interesting vision. Uh, the idea is that, you know, you're focused on the TV, but you get these peripheral effects like around your TV. And this was uh, designed kind of as a, as an Xbox peripheral, if you will. So that was a Luma room. And then after that, we, we started thinking about, well, why, why don't we um, uh, play around with uh, mul you know, multiple projectors, get back into that, that kind of thing, and then you know, do projected augmented reality, or call, you know, some people call it spatial augmented reality, uh, where we use you know, as many as, let's say, six. I think this system had six projectors, uh, four or five depth cameras, maybe. And then you get these kinds of effects. So this was all. Um, you know, that particular scene was rendered in Unity. And we, we have this kind of, you know, interesting uh, transformation of your physical environment. And again, you're not, you're not wearing a headset, you're actually relying on the physical, on the, on the projection, right? And so, and uh, this is Brett uh, um, Jones, Jones and uh, Raj Sodi. They were interns when they worked on this. And then they went on to uh, commercialize um, uh, aspects of this work with their, with their company and they sell a product um, that where you can, uh, a single projector and single camera where you can actually like, you know, pull off some of these effects. And they have very nice software and design uh, to, uh, to create these things. Lightform uh, is, the, is the name of their product. Anyway, so, you know, there the, the, the challenge was calibrating uh, these systems, right? If, if I give you a pile of projectors and a pile of cameras, that can be really tough to um, uh, to um, calibrate, you know, if you're a, a game designer, you probably know uh, not a lot about uh, com computer vision based, you know, calibration techniques. And so we uh, created this Room Alive uh, toolkit, um, which um, uh, tries to, to make that easy and automatic. And I'll talk about a, a bit about that later. Here's a kind of a you know bit of a fast forward again into you know where we were a few years after Room Alive. The quality is getting a little bit better, and you actually get this this kind of um, you know a pretty clean rendering and um, sensing around the the coffee table. And then this is also a, a demo of a viewpoint dependent projection, right? So as I move the camera, the real physical camera here. You can see the, the the change in the projection, so that it gives a, this illusion that that the uh, object is 3D. It's a little more clearly um, uh, visible here in this particular rendering, and that's really just because we're you know calculating out the math to figure out where the projection is, taking into account the shape of the of the projection surface, and then also the position of the uh, of the viewer. Now that's a viewpoint dependent sort of thing. But so, and so naturally you start to think, well, can I do anything uh, mathematically correct for multiple viewers, right? Since there's only one projection and you have, you're projecting this kind of hologram and you're just a quick, you know, one idea of uh, where here we're projecting this globe onto one side of the display. Meanwhile, for the, the other person in the room, uh, he is seeing projected onto me, um, uh, you know, the other side of the globe, right? And so he is actually getting uh, some version of, 
of the scene meant for him. And so that makes sense now for two, uh, two people. Um, we also started uh, looking at uh, teleconferencing, right? And so the notion that you could use projectors to project a, uh, a full size, like a life size version of the person you're interacting with um, in a video conferencing um, uh, session is, is very interesting. You know, the idea that you could be um, looking at some, um, someone in Zoom, but that, you know, not, have, not having to sit in front of a, a black rectangle that displays pixels uh, and instead, you know, look at um, uh, look at the person uh, superimposed into your actual world. I think is something that you know is still a very interesting idea. So the Room Alive toolkit. This is something that I mentioned earlier, and um, it is uh, basically uh, you know allows you to to create interactive projection mapping experiences. Possibly with holograms, uh, you know, as as we talk about holograms in the in the Hololens world, right? What we mean is viewpoint dependent rendering. Uh, there's support for multiple connects and multiple projectors, and uh, the calibration tool is meant to be something that uh, that anybody can can use uh, within reason. And there's you know projection mapping samples. We open sourced that in 2015. You can go to GitHub and take a look at that. Um, I should mention, I'm not doing a lot of work with that particular version these days. Um, uh, I'm actually moving on to a, uh, a successor to Room Alive, which, which I have not released yet, uh, but it's something that I'm actually using uh, at the moment for this, for this presentation, actually. Talking about, uh, about this one. Hey, how's it going? You Good. Good. So um, how, I guess, how convincing was the 3D effect in, in Room Alive, right? Um, it, I guess it delivers a single viewpoint, so it feels like if you're far away, maybe it feels um, 3D, um, but you know, there's no stereo aspect. So does that sort of, to the user, I mean, to the camera, it looks great. To, the, to a user, does it, does it still feel very 3D? Yeah, that's, I think that's a really good point. You know, when we see these um, AR demonstrations, they're in camera and you watch the videos online, it's like, it, it's, there's always there's a bit of a sleight of hand right going on here because it, it always looks like a million bucks right because there's no latency right you're you're render, you're, you're you're watching exactly you know as the designer intended without latency uh, between the motion uh, you know and the you know so so it always looks it always looks you know really good when it's in camera like the, when you render it um, the one thing that we did, um, and then you also, you know, there's also this issue around the, without a stereo presentation, you know, what are you, what are you missing? And of course, uh, you know, the, the limits of depth perception via binocular disparity are well known. People have characterized this. We ran a study um, on a, uh, we gave people this task uh, of, you know, you, you put your hand up and then we use projection mapping to render a cube in your hand, right? And so, you know, much of the cube is in fact on the wall opposite, you know, uh, the wall that's in front of you, right? Which might be, you know, several feet away. And the question is, you know, when I uh, when I do that, and then I get, and then I gave we gave the participants each, you know, a, a set of real physical cubes, and we ask them which one is it, right? Is it the small one, the medium one, or the large one? And you know, people did. I don't have the numbers in front of me that I was working. We did so so long ago, but people did surprisingly well, right? And I think there are a couple of things that are going on here. One is that as you are given the ability to move, right, and you get a little bit of parallax and you have this kind of, you know, parallax of course is one of those um, depth cues that's quite powerful and maybe a little underappreciated and um, sometimes. Um, and, um, and so you get a sense of where uh, the cube is, therefore its size. Um, the fact that, that in this experiment, when you're actually like interacting with the cube, you very quickly associate the cube with, you know, uh, uh, your hand, right? And so you know where your hand is and therefore you have this kind of, um, I think what, what a lot of people would call apparent size uh, at play. And I think when you have that interactive eye-hand coordination of having the cube in the, my hand, which I'm moving back and forth, I'm, you know, as I, every time I move, I'm performing little experiments, right? And pretty quickly you deduce um, the size uh, of the object. And so people did pretty well, even though there was no uh, binocular disparity. Clearly you could do binocular disparity. In the original Room Alive system, we used, um, 
I think they're called uh, display link projectors, you know, where they all uh, could use um, uh, 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 shutter glasses and you get a stereo um, presentation. And that was fun too. There's another project mm -hmm. I'm not even reporting here in this, this, uh, this talk, but. Hi, could I jump into the question? Yeah, please. Uh, um, I'm curious about how the experience of using Rumor Life compared to with like an AR headset you can get today. So I'm guessing like one of the main advantages is you basically have an infinite field of view. So how would that uh, affect immersion and sort of just how does the experience compare? Yeah, that's a great point. And it, it's something that, um, yeah, I, I should mention, yeah, the, the, the ability to render um, everywhere all at once, right? In, in a room scale environment, that's, that's a big deal, right? So you definitely get that immersion. The other thing is that there's no, um, there's no kind of latency or, or you know, or you don't have to worry about the, the, the sloshing of the graphics as you look around. Now, you know, HoloLens, they, they've gone to great lengths to ensure that um, uh, that, that is not really a, a, a problem anymore. Um, you know, you have late stage rendering and, you know, um, all sorts of techniques to really reduce um, uh, the, the latency as you move your view. Uh, but in this case, you know, by construction, it's not an issue, right? Um, and so that's a big deal. I would say, you know, for, for my money, like the um, being able to render into the room, you know, is going gonna, is gonna to make sense also for multiple simultaneous users, right? So having a lot of people in the room, you know, even given the fact that you have, uh, you're not giving a, a, a correct mathematical present, you know, mathematically, it's not a correct presentation for each person. You know, I think it's a, it's a little bit analogous to, um, uh, you know, when you buy a, a home theater system, you know, mathematically, there's a there's only a single point in the room for which that audio presentation is correct. Um, but for, you know, so there's but you know, but even so, you know, you you have multiple people in the room. Some people are on the left, some people are on the right of the sweet spot on the couch, and you know, you kind of um, get along. So yeah, so that's that's a good question. I'm I'm glad you asked it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. So, you know, projection mapping, if you haven't seen it, you know, maybe you've seen, um, uh, you know, demos of this before, uh, you know, there's some things online where people project on the buildings. And the idea is, you know, it's, this is a computer graphics thing, right? What do you render on the projector so that the viewer has a desired perception, right? And you have to account for the, the shape of the projection surface, the pose of the projector, the eye position and so forth. You know, so here's a, a street artists have been doing this for a while. This is kind of a fun example where, you know, from this particular viewpoint, it looks like, you know, this person is stepping across uh, this 3D scene. Now from their point of view, they may not have that impression. Um, so these are very unique. You know, some of these, some of these artists, uh, you know, have gone to some pretty interesting uh, extremes in, in, in doing this. This is all done with, with chalk. Um, here's, a, here's one that's particularly interesting in that it's, you know, it's very sensitive to the, the position of the user. This guy has done, um, uh, Felice Varini, he's done um, examples where, you know, you have to be standing on the rooftop and then you look over to the city and you see from a very particular point of view, you see something uh, painted out over the city. Like, I guess he was just, you know, sneaking around rooftops in the middle of the night doing uh, his work. Um, and uh, so here's a view of what it's like to do the, the actual projection. Um, we have three, uh, these are Connect 2s, uh, uh, the, the, the one that shipped with the uh, Xbox One, and then we're projecting uh, grade code. So there's no, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the cameras and the projectors. You can have as many uh, projectors or cameras um, as, um, as, as, you know, as you can mount or network, and uh, they can be, you know, you can kind of mix and match them. So these, we're projecting gray codes here. That's a pretty standard way to do, um, uh, you know, uh, structured light imaging to recover the, the, the shape. Um, here we're using uh, gray codes to establish the correspondence between a pixel in the projected image and a pixel in the uh, depth camera view, right? And then, um, and then so after that, you can add, uh, let's say another uh, connect camera to do head tracking, and then you know this is another um, um, idea of now I've got the sense that there's you know a virtual object, this little uh, floor plan of a house that's kind of floating somewhere between 
um, the uh, myself and the wall. So this is one of the samples that we deliver. And it, this is a view of what what the uh, each of the projectors is actually showing, right? And um, and so you have uh, you know all this kind of crazy distortion. And you know this is approximately if you look in the center one down the middle of the line is approximately where the corner of the room lies. Now later, um, uh, we've done some work to um, to deal with the fact that you know slinging depth data around is really hard, and there, there are, um, as far as I'm aware, there's there's really no um, good uh, video codec out there to deal with the depth data. You know, for this for this presentation, right? I'm still using the H.264, but it's all rendered. Like you can't control the viewpoint. Um, I control the viewpoint, and you know if you really want to deliver on this whole uh, promise of 3D video, you need to be able to ship that around. And so this is, um, in this video, I, I'm demonstrating a codec that's, it's a lossless codec, right? So the, the actual savings are not that, that tremendous, but it also demonstrates the kind of sensing that you can get uh, when you instrument, uh, let's say a conference room at Microsoft. And um, here we have um, eight cameras uh, stitched together using the calibration that I just uh, demonstrated. And then um, uh, you actually you probably can't tell, but that's Eric Whitmire um, on the upper left-hand corner, and then uh, uh, some other former interns. Um, so there's a so there's definitely still work to be done in terms of compression and you know signal processing and, and just dealing with this uh, this kind of video. You know, once you've got the user study, a we um, meetings with six groups, each you know a bit of. Um, calibration of the of a conference room, you can start doing things like, uh, you know, project everywhere. So this is a system we call Meet Alive. And essentially, it's a, the idea is as a windowing system for your, your room, right? So there's no sort of primal position. Um, here's, you see the, the skeletal tracking. There's no kind of primal position for the presenter. Everybody can sort of throw a window up on the display. And so, yeah, the way I like to think about it is it's like a windowing system for your environment, right? And so there isn't kind of um, uh, a single place where you can project you anywhere is potentially uh, a projection surface. And so that's meet alive. And so that's this is something we're we're very interested in as well. A lot of different things that uh, I've been working on over the years, and you know makes a few you know <laughs> assertions about uh, you know how we can transcend sort of this notion of form factors. You know, it's not necessarily the the, the HMD or the actual Thing that you put on your head that's that's really the the important bit it's the interaction and the the, the representations that the experience give you and then it, it could be up to up to the user as to how they um they actually uh experience the title right and so i think that we could we could start considering how we um how we deliver software so that it works in ar and vr simul you know uh, you know in the same um in the same binary for example and thinking about different kinds of interactions, there are a couple of things to note about that video. One is that, yeah, I'm taking off the the HMD, um, but uh, you know, I, I I still have the controllers in my hands, right? And you know, so can I can I actually do something about that? Can I actually do you know what if I'm just using my hand tracking? Well, the, the you know the issue now is that well, those controllers have you know several buttons on them, and so it's it's a bit tricky to to, to try to emulate that. So um, that system used uh, a system we call Reality Shader. Um, and so this is, um, uh, if you're following along the development of the, of the software part of what I'm talking about, this is Room Alive 2.0, really. And it uh, has support for uh, the RealSense cameras, the Kinect cameras, and the, new, the newer Azure Kinect cameras. And it is refactored to, you know, to support a, ver a variety of game engines. Uh, the open VR support is something that I demonstrated in this in this video just now. Playing around with the the custom depth image codecs, uh, one of which I showed you uh, earlier, and then we're playing around also with um, you know rendering techniques uh, with cube map you know cube mapped uh, projection mapping is kind of my default um, means of doing projection mapping, and then there's, we've also got some things where we we take some omnidirectional video that's shot with you know one of these 360 degree cameras and then render that into into the room and that could be uh, quite compelling as well 
So I, I just want to, um, I'm going to throw on a few, few other things here that are just um, kind of fun. And this was like, you know, we can call this uh, COVID work if you like. Um, I guess my hair was a little shorter back then. So this was about, yeah, about a year ago, I was sitting around at home uh, with not, nothing much to do. This is my basement. Uh, it's kind of a mess. And um, so I did this kind of really funny thing where uh, we use the, the, the person tracking. Actually, you know, I could demo the person tracking on Azure Connect right now, which is kind of fun. So um, I can show the, like for me, I can show, um, you know, what it's doing with the, uh, you know, the body tracking as I sit here in front of the camera. And then you can see that, you know, so I'm just superimposing the 3D model of the of the tracked um, camera. And so, so it's actually, you know, it's 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 evolved a little bit since the connect, the original Connect. It uses um, uh, DNNs, and uh, you can see it. You know, it also does things like, you know, it's getting the eye position, um, you know, uh, somewhat better. Uh, it's not perfect, but um, by the way, so I, this system, you know, I'm using a Reality Shader. Um, here to, uh, to to do the the rendering and the sensing, I can also add in another camera, and and what what I'm showing you here is something that I just cobbled together just recently, where you know there's this whole issue of how to do the calibration of multiple cameras, and here what I've done is something very kind of a little bit cheesy maybe, where I don't worry about it too much. What I do is I take the skeletal tracking from both cameras, okay, and then I match them, right? So. I presume they're from the same person and then I uh, take all of the 3D points from both cameras and then solve for the, the transformation that brings one into the other. And so you have a very kind of coarse um, alignment here. The neat thing about this technique is that, you know, I can go in and move one of the cameras a bit um, and then it, 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 you know, it adaptively um, catches up with, with that change, right? Now the merging here is, is nothing to write home about. I'm just rendering one thing on top of another. There's clearly, you know, more work to be done in terms of how, you know, like I'm showing this to anybody who knows any, anything about real computer graphics research is kind of embarrassing, but um, this gives you, you know, kind of, you know, one idea of how the, how we can use the, the skeletal tracking um, to do, you know, it's kind of a basic alignment. But um, in this, this particular video, um, I'm doing something, you know, remember, if you think back to the early part of the pandemic, you know, we were, we were all concerned about, uh, you know, uh, gosh, you know, you shouldn't be sitting around touching your face all the time. I don't know if you remember that. Um, it seems almost farcical now, but, but back then it was really easy. It took me about 20 minutes to write a program that detects this. And it was really funny to, to the Washington Post actually put together, a, you know, a, a, an anthology of videos of, of uh, public officials coming out and saying, you know, on, you know, that you shouldn't be touching your face. And then the, and then the process of giving that presentation, they, they would actually touch their face. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of these things is completely difficult to, to, to keep track of. Anyway, so this is really easy to do. Of course, anybody who's actually done anything with the body tracking SDK knows that you can just do, do these kinds of things. And it, it was literally 15 minutes of work. And so I, I showed this around um, uh, to some people and um, and I thought, well, this is you know this is kind of interesting. You know, it's a very simple example of what you can do uh, with um, with uh, the sort of 3D computations. Remember in that um, the earlier video of the LightSpace project where we're manipulating photos on tabletops. You know, there there was a very um, a crude idea of intersection of of the of the person's body, the user's body, with the environment. And you could, the way that we did, um, you can look into the result, uh, the, the details in the paper, but the, there's this idea that you can transfer, let's say an object from one surface to another. And the way you did that is you, you would touch the one surface and then you would touch the other surface. And the system would detect that there was, you know, physical contact between those two surfaces. This was even before we had any sort of skeletal tracking. It was literally, uh, a kind of a connected components analysis among multiple cameras. And it was, the neat thing about it was that it was just, just very robust uh, in the sense that, you know, it wasn't relying on some skeletal tracker that would fail. It was actually in some sense detecting a physical property uh, of the scene and, and, you know, doing that very quickly. Um, and so in this particular, um, uh, subs, you know, the subsequent work here from the face touching example, 
or shake hands with another person. We generalize on that. Right, this is a little long. Detect shaking hands. This is my son. He's not very happy to be doing this, this video, but. Multiple cameras can cover a larger area. Here we show two cameras and merge body tracking results in blue. We can also detect when people touch their physical environment and possibly transmit the virus. The detection of probable touching of inanimate objects in the environment, which, when accumulated over time, suggests the presence of fomites, inanimate physical objects that are frequently touched and are thought to spread the virus. We propose a simplistic... So I want to be clear, you know, this is, this is where our, our knowledge was last year in terms of thinking about the spread of, of the virus. This is not, um, you know, I, I think the CDC... I think it's still a little bit up for debate whether or not, you know, how important fomites are. And as everyone knows, it's much more, the discussion today is much more around uh, transmission through the air, which the system does not model. But I want to, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how I think that this is, you know, just an example of, of sensing you can do in, in 3D. Model of virus transmission where the contagion may be gathered from a fomite and scattered on another body part. So you'll notice, sorry, in that as frequently touched and are thought to spread the virus. Sorry. We propose as so in this particular um, moment, the we start off with the the, the red hand uh, marked as contaminated, right? And um, and then you'll see as as uh, as I touch various parts of the environment, the the that. Uh, that marking uh, spreads. Simplistic model of virus transmission where the contagion may be gathered from a fomite and scattered on another body part or part of the environment. So we're just kind of spreading the projection mapping may be used to display in real time the evolution of fomites and social distancing among multiple people. So this is just displaying in, in the real world what we calculated earlier using the projection mapping. And then here's the notion that we can use projection mapping to um, to show when social distance is being violated. Such techniques may find application in particularly vulnerable settings such as schools, long-term care facilities, physician offices, and other venues where the cost of installing a network of cameras and projectors may be negligible compared to the cost of the potential loss of life. So yeah, so so as I have said a couple times, right, the the um the uh uh, you know, our knowledge of how the, the virus is transmitted has evolved quite a bit since then. But I think the, the thing that's interesting about this, um, that particular work was, you know, it really wasn't that hard to put together. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, that really, you know, came together in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, the actual computation there of, of keeping a histogram of where you touch, uh, you know, that there's a single shader that's about, you know, I don't know, 10 lines of code that's that's keeping that 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 mesh up to date with this kind of histogram and you can imagine you know doing other kinds of things with it and i like this this notion of being able to compute you know kinds of primitive uh interactions with your environment and keeping track of those and and deducing uh, various interesting things of it you know so the idea of you know like um uh, you know you leave a tool on the ground and then you see somebody you know pick it up later. And th these are the kinds of things that one could uh, one could probably calculate very easily with this and and not have to go through the the kind of the 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 trouble of having to recognize the tool in the first place. These are the kinds of things that you could probably deduce 
um, you know, just from the physical properties uh, that, that, that are apparent from the, looking at the, the sequence of images. So I think that's, a, that's probably a good place to start, uh, stop rather. And um, uh, anyway, so, um, and I think that that's a, a kind of a good summary of the overall arc of, you know, the, the kinds of things that I've been doing with depth cameras as well as uh, projectors and, you know, kind of a, a, a somewhat a different view of augmented reality that, that, that you, than you might be used to. And uh, I'd be happy to, to chat about any of these, these things that I've presented and more. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, we have some time for questions. So while you're all thinking about your questions, I'll ask one. Um, again, this is a great talk and I loved all the experiences. Um, I'm always curious about resolution. Uh, what do you think about like, you know, at what level of resolution um, those experience become, you know, better or more uh, usable to like wider um, population. Resolution in terms of like the the rendering resolution like, we're seeing or here. Like quality, yeah, like you know, no, no holes, no like that. Everything yeah. is not wiggly. Like there's like you know the <clears throat> glasses appear and. Yeah, so I don't have a good answer to the, you know if there's a magical threshold, of, you know, at, at which point you know people will, um, you know, become more accepting of the of this kind of thing. I think, yeah, I feel like we're not quite there. Um, on the other hand, I you know I marvel at um, just how crummy um, audio can be on let's say a, a you know right a, a cell phone connection, and yet still people you know will will use it. Right, and it, it it's it's just a kind of a. The fact is, like you know, it's 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 important if you want to talk to your mom. It's it's probably more important that you're able to talk to your mom, who may be living very far away, than the quality of the connection. Yeah, sure, you would you would love it if the quality of the connection were better, but that still doesn't prevent you from valuing it as a as a mode of communication, right? And and so I think that um, it's really there's a kind of a cost benefit analysis. And I think we're not quite there yet um, in terms of, uh, you know, 3D video. I think there are a lot of people, you know, they're going to be working on um, improving the quality of the reconstruction. That's probably not going to be me. I'm probably not going to be the one who, who does that work. Um, but, you know, and I think there are people that are far smarter in terms of um, those those techniques that are probably deliver those those kinds of improvements is getting better all the time. It's really interesting, also. Like you know, if you go back to um, to YouTube, you know, go to YouTube and go back and watch some some video that was um, uh, scan you know scanned in from a VHS tape, and you look at that and you're like, wow, that looks like hell, right? It's just terrible looking video. But then, you know, like, okay, fine. But that was the, that's what we had back then. And you didn't know any better, right? And so it was, um, you thought it was fine back then. Uh, so only now do you, you know, you start like, you know, your, 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 uh, your tolerances have changed quite a bit. So we'll see, you know, that's, that's kind of why I, I like to show that video in the very beginning of the talk with uh, the minority report sequence. Uh, because I think that, that that's kind of where we are today with some of this 3D video. I can't remember who uh, told me this story, but about the movie that um, um, I remember hearing the story that the quality of the actual depth reconstruction was better than <clears throat> what was shown in the, in the movie mm -hmm. because um, uh, Spielberg, oh, like the producers felt like it looks uh, too real and not futuristic enough. So yeah. they gotta add all that stuff, um, uh, like uh, to to blur things a little to make it worse, uh, yep. wise to make it more futuristic, or more like imaginary. Well, yeah, a lot of people will 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 look at that movie and they'll think, um, "Wow, that's really a comment on on you know on the future, and we should all be working towards that." Uh, but, you know, it's also important to realize that that was also um, a vision of, of, of a certain kind of technical dystopia, right? If you really, if you look at the, what's really going on in that movie, there are quite a few, um, uh, you know, kind of awful things that have, that have 
come true since then in terms of privacy and just the relationship between us and technology, you know, us and technology. And the, there was a group, as I mentioned, that was assembled to, to, um, you know, to inform uh, Spielberg and his associates on, you know, what, where the state of the art would be at the time that the movie, the, the events um, um, played out. And it, you know, and I and I think that the the uh, you know Jerry Lanier likes to talk about the fact that in fact they, they were gunning for a a kind of, a certain kind of dystopic view of of the future, and so um, you know it's uh, it's interesting to to think about the interplay between you know when we put those kinds of things out there as a science fiction artifact, and then and then we have a bunch of HCI researchers who are trying to emulate those things. Right? <laughs> is that really what we want to be doing, or do we want to be looking elsewhere? I don't know. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I can go. This is a really cool talk. Thanks for doing it. Um, I'm I'm curious if um, uh, what, what do you see as like the next step in reality shader? Do you think it's ever going to be possible to sort of uh, rather than have like like a set room with cameras and connects all around to sort of compress it in a more portable form? So sort of like the sixth sense technology, if you've seen that, or something you can wear and go about your day and see holograms around you? Yeah, so um, we've, we haven't built a, um, we haven't built a, like a handheld version of it, kind of like uh, what, what you saw with sixth sense mm -hmm. yet, uh, but there's really no reason why you couldn't do that. Like in some sense, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really easy to do because the if your if your camera and your projector are statically mounted together, you know the calibration is a one-time event, right? And the, and, it, and it almost plays to the strengths of reality shader because, as, you know, the thing that one of the things that matters, of course, is to bring in the shape of the projection surface so you, you can account for it. And but because you know it's a point that, that I haven't really been making in terms of the projection that you because they're using a depth camera to read the shape that 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 depth camera that that shape data is live right that you're bringing you're bringing that in at video rates so any kind of you know in in any of those demos if somebody got up and moved the furniture around it wouldn't matter it would just keep up with that right uh, so it wouldn't change the 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 projection uh, to you know in the user's view it wouldn't change the projection at all aside from a, maybe a little bit of latency so by that token, like if you if you built a a system that had you know just a projector and a and a handheld camera, that that quality of of being able to read the the depth data in real time and then using that in the projection, well, that's exactly what it does, and that's exactly what you would want, right? So that as you move this handheld device around, maybe or maybe it's a wearable or something um, that you could um, you know uh, it, it would update appropriately in real time. Now the the other thing I wanted to comment on um, was uh, I showed a few little videos of uh, the telepresence demo where we're projecting uh, people into the, in the into the real world in a life size way. We also did a version of that. I didn't show it, but uh, it's actually it shows a little bit better than than some of the stuff I showed. Where um, it's a statically mounted, um, it's two statically mounted um, connect cameras, one projector. And it's all sort of mounted in a in a pedestal, okay? Like a, the the vision was a box, right? That you plug into the wall. I give you one of those um, that's matched to the one that I've got, and we set those up in our room. And then maybe I set it up so that um, I'm projecting into an empty couch, and you're projecting yours um, into an empty couch, and then we have this kind of two-way um, video projection. Um, and uh, you, know, you can do all of the, the kinds of projection mapping things I just showed. But the point was that, yeah, you don't need a room full of cameras and projectors. You don't need to worry about calibration, right? Because if everything is statically mounted together, then you don't, there's no, uh, the calibration is done at the factory, if you will. Um, and, uh, and so that was kind of a, you know, something else that we did is kind of a vision, you know, it was after, spending all that time with these these crazy you know six camera six projector systems i kind of wanted to dial it back and say you know wow what can we do with something that's much much less 
We also did a version where the uh, the projector and the camera still statically mounted, but they they moved under the control of the computer, right? So we put them on a on um, a pan tilt head, uh, sufficiently strong to hold the system. And there, um, you know, there are certain uh, advantages to be had when you when you have that kind of arrangement. Um, and uh, what we did uh, for that system was, you know, sometimes you go to um, well back before COVID, I mean, you might have gone to a you know a music you know you know a rock show or something like that, and you would see like robotically controlled lights, and you know, were thinking about you know what if we take one of those robotically controlled lights, rip the light off, put the projector and the depth camera on there, and then we can do um, you know in theory we can do spatial augmented reality kind of anywhere the the camera points, and then the system was was also had this interesting property that as you moved it around, it would also build up a, uh, you know, a 3D model of, of the entire room using Connect Fusion. Um, and then you can do other, you know, other things with that as well. Um, and so that's a system where there's, again, no calibration. You would need to, you know, in our, in our case, we hung it in the ceiling, um, but you could also imagine like a little device that you, you, know, you set on a desktop that does this kind of thing. And the other challenge, um, you know, from the software perspective, is really figuring out, well, where do I point it now, right? Where do you know? I have this. I've traded one problem for another, right? I, I used to have the ability to project everywhere, and now I have the ability to project only a single place. I can probably do a brighter projection at that little spot, but now I have to write code to decide where to actually do that projection, right? And then so that gets into you know some other issues. So that makes a lot of sense. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for the questions. I think it's it's just an extension of you know what Curtis was asking before and some of your answer. I mean, um, this idea, right? And particularly, sort of in contrast to HMDs, or right? HMDs allow the user allow for a more portable experience, more mobile experience potentially, right? And like, there's an argument that a lot of the use cases of augmented reality, um, I think that are and, you know, people want to deal with is, is maybe they're focusing at a specific place or on a specific task, and therefore they want to take their device to that task. And I think like a lot of, you know, there's that's some of the philosophy be, behind HoloLens and having it without a tether and all of this was, was based around probably this idea that um, this philosophy that was also driven by, you know, the rest mo mobile computing, right? Uh, and then I think you, you know, you, you talked about here putting a projector uh projector based ar system sort of statically mounted to a space um i was wondering you know what do you see maybe as and, and you know the the use cases that we've seen here are things like the room alive where you know you extend gaming um or some of these um you know tabletop gaming as you have in in like the surface table for example um what do you feel are like the, the major use cases of projective AR in the consumer? I guess if you're targeting the consumer space in this consumer space, um, given that it's like static, right? That it's, that it's, you know, locked to a certain location or a certain place. Yeah, so it, it's, um, I guess what I, en I envision is um, a future where these distinctions kind of don't matter so much, right? That if I want to go, take a walk outside with my telepresence uh, session intact, right? I grab my, my HMD, right? It's kind of like if I wanted to take this meeting, for example, and I, you know, I'm sitting in front of a very nice display. It's a 4K, 40 inch display. It's beautiful, right? But if I want to go take a walk, I'm going to move that, that, that the session onto my phone and I'm going to go take a walk. But you know, if I'm if I'm anywhere near my 4K display, I'm going to drop that phone. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to use that. Um, it's it's terrible, right? It, it's just not a very good experience. And so I think that there, even in the home, I think you will find that uh, there's this kind of range or you know or continuum of infrastructure um, that where it makes sense to you know to really leverage you know, the cost of displays and the form factor and comfort. You know, the next thing is, you know, I desperately want to be able to, um, you know, get up and move around. I don't want to be planted and, you know, in front of anything for such a long time. 
Um, does that mean that I, I, I switch to my phone? Well, I guess in your case, that's probably what it means. I see that you, you're coming in on your phone. Um, but I can also envision, you know, you know, having multiple displays in, in my, um, my home environment that, you know, and the session just kind of follows along, you know, wherever it can, it'll, it'll bring the, 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 uh, the, the display to me, it'll bring the graphics to me. And so I think that, that I think it may, just makes sense that you, 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 you can have it all that you know, why decide when you can have, you can, you can have both. Right. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the, the consumer space is sort of a challenge, right? Because things are getting, you know, things are, you know, more price sensitive, but displays are getting so cheap these days. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, maybe projection is not the answer. Maybe it's, you know, large wall sized uh, displays. That, that sounds good. Uh, I see no reason why we couldn't work with that. Um, uh, in the, in a more, in the office setting, of course, you have, you know, way more tolerance for, for mounting things and, and, you know, setting up infrastructure where it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I, I think in, 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 when we're thinking about um, telepresence, one of the, the scenarios that we're thinking very deeply about these days is the so-called hybrid setting where let's say we all um, go back to work at Microsoft, right? So, uh, and let's say this fall, we, you know, half of us go back to work and then half are, of us are at home. Well, that's that's an interesting setting, right? Because the the half that's in the uh, at the office, they have you know they're in the conference rooms. They have kind of a privileged place, I would say, in terms of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Right? They get the best um, infrastructure, the best conference room, maybe the best audio, the best video. And then you have people who are coming in uh, remotely who have always been kind of um, second class, if you will, in terms of when they meet, right? It's always, it's very easy to forget the person who dials in to a meeting. Um, you've, I'm certain you've experienced this. Um, and, and so the question is, how do you, what do you, what can you do to, to bring those people in so that they actually feel like they're included, right? And so one of the things that, that I've been uh, a big proponent of is using these kinds of techniques, you know, such as using the depth cameras or whatever, uh, or other kinds of reconstruction techniques so that we can render people, you know, bring them into the conference room so that they, you know, that we can um, have a geometrically correct rendering so that when I, you know, so that when you, let's see, so if I'm in the local room and then I look at you and you're the remote participant that you actually see that I'm looking at you, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so uh, anyway, there, there's, I think there's just a, a real range um, of options. There's a real continuum. I don't think it's going to shake out as everything is going to be a headset. I, I can't imagine a future where, you know, eight of us get together in a conference room when we're all wearing HoloLenses. Um, you know, maybe it'll be something else. Uh, you know, if, if I had, um, you know, a set of eyeglasses like the ones I'm wearing right now, and they happen to be, uh, you know, good AR displays, then maybe I, you know, maybe I. Uh, I go with that, um, but until then, like I think there there's going to be a range of options. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I definitely I feel like we've uh, we're maybe starting to turn that corner with audio, perhaps. I know my my headphones connect to you know multiple devices within my house, right? And so when I you know move from my move a call from my computer to my phone, um, it's not seamless yet, but you know it's it's definitely a, it's a very nice user experience, right? To be able to, to take a call on, on one device and then, you know, move it, transfer it smoothly to another. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andy. Let's do a, if you guys can um, turn on your mics and let's do a, um, a collective clap. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>